Amen, amen, amen. How's everybody doing? So glad to be worshiping again tonight. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to my good brother and friend, uh, Reverend Dr. Charles Dorsey, who held it down last week. I pray that you were as blessed as I was. I got to check it out uh, online. I'm just so grateful that I got friends that will stand in the gap, that love me enough to let me call them uh, in, the, in an emergency and, and, and will step in for you, uh, and that are smart enough to to teach people and love the Lord enough to teach about the word of God. So uh, a shout out to him and then uh, to Dr. Hines for preaching an amazing sermon and leading us in worship and to the whole Parks Chapel family uh, for just getting us uh, up and worshiping the Lord together. And so we're excited about tonight. Tonight we are in Galatians, the fifth chapter. Uh, the 13th through the 26th verses, Galatians, the fifth chapter, uh, the 13th through the 26th verses. Um, and uh, just excited to get into the word. Uh, I'll put that in the chat. So if you wish to follow along and worship along with us, that you can. Let's go ahead and get into the spirit of worship. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy tried and true and with thanksgiving i'll be a living sanctuary lord for you lord we just thank you for this day and for your blessings we thank you for all your wonder and love what you've done for us and brought us through and shown us uh, so far, we ask that you would continue to let your light shine on us throughout the week uh, and that you would bless us tonight to learn more about you and your word and ourselves. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. All right. All right. Let's jump into this. Uh, as I said, we are in the fifth chapter of Galatians. Uh, and we're going to start at the 13th verse. And it reads, uh, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this commandment. Love your neighbors as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will destroy each other. Watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you, so that you, are, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, 
hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness and orgies, <coughs> and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucif have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying one another. Amen. Amen. Again, that is Galatians, the fifth chapter, uh, the 13th through the 26th verses. Uh, I want to start with a little bit of context uh, for the past number of, uh, of weeks. We have really for the past month and a half, we have been working and, and talking about the gifts of uh, the gifts of the spirit. And we've identified the gifts of the spirit uh, as the way that the Holy Spirit operates in us, uh, as the way that the Holy Spirit uh, manifests itself in action. Uh, and so there we see a number of uh, of gifts. We see speaking in tongues. We see healing. We see prophesying. We see these external uh, expressions of what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of uh, inside of us <clears throat> as we grow in relationship. Uh, but it is really a a pushing forth, and it is. Uh, what God does inside of us to make an impact in the lives of other people. Uh, what we are talking about tonight as the fruits of the Holy Spirit are, uh, the fruits of the Holy Spirit are how the Holy Spirit shows up in our character. Uh, what we want to identify tonight as our Christ character. This is not so much about an external thing that comes forth from us. Uh, this is about uh, how God shows up in our posture, in the way that we talk, in the way that we act, in the way that we engage with people, in the way that we love on people. Uh, I would direct, uh, these are the characteristics or the personality the way that the, the personality of the Holy Spirit uh, manifests and shows itself, not so much our actions, but the way that the Holy Spirit's personality uh, shows up and wells up in us. Does that make sense? So if you go with me, if you check out verse 19, uh, you'll see the, uh, I'm sorry, verse 22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? These are characteristics. These are things that show up in how we speak to people and how we deal with people. Um, and I just want to highlight tonight that uh, <clears throat> the fruits of the Spirit probably will make people more receptive to receiving the, the action of the gifts of the Spirit. Have you ever thought about or encountered people who uh, know really how to pray really well or are really good preachers, but their personality, their character is in question? Have you ever had to deal with somebody who knows the Bible backward and forward and up and down, uh, but they do not they do not express love and peace? We have whole communities right now inside of inside of the Christian family where they know about the Bible and they know about Jesus, but they are not exhibiting the fruits. In other words, the Christ character, the characteristics of the Holy Spirit are not shown forth in how they engage and interact with the world. Um, and, and so when we are talking about the fruits of the Spirit, we're not talking about the external impact that the gifts that of God has placed in us 
what we are talking about is how the spirit of how the character of the Holy Spirit or the Christ character in us shows up. Does that make sense? Hey, Sister Caldwell, good to see you tonight. It's so good to have you worshiping with us. Uh, as a matter of fact, we can take a moment if you're worshiping with us, whether it's over Facebook uh, or if you're worshiping with us on Zoom, uh, if you're with us on YouTube, just give us an amen in the chat box so we know that you're with us, so we know uh, who to, to reach out to as we uh, as we go through this lesson. Amen. Just give me a, a amen and a hallelujah so I know that you're with me. Uh, the other thing that we want to highlight tonight, just to, to create some additional context, uh, in Galatians, uh, Paul is introducing this idea uh, and this comparison, and we see it throughout all of his letters, really, uh, but to the, to the Christians in Galatia, we see this comparison of living by the law versus living by the spirit, living by the law versus living by the spirit. Uh, and, and this is a very important conversation, particularly into the Galatians, because they had they were on the right track. They were doing what God had called them to do. They were, they were maturing into this new Christian lifestyle uh, in, a, in a very healthy way. And if you go back to the beginning of this chapter, if you read the book, Paul, this part of the letter, Paul is imploring them not to let that go because there are now people who are moving back into this legalistic uh, perspective and view uh, of, hey, Sister Brown, uh, we have the, these folks who are moving back into a legalistic view of what it means to be a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. And otherwise, in other words, we have people that are now encouraging that in order to be a true Christian, you've got to live by the law. And you might say, well, pastor, what's wrong with that? You know, of, of course, we should be living by the law. Of course, we should uh, we should be following Jesus and following the Ten Commandments and doing everything that his commandments say. And absolutely. Uh, but what we are talking about in this text and when we talk about living by the law, uh, what's happening is that people are foregoing the relationship with the Holy Spirit and returning back to this list where we can check off boxes, right? It's the thing that we see consistently throughout the history of the Hebrew people and the thing that Jesus is continuously and God is continuously trying to, uh, to fix is that relationship with God is not about following a list of laws. Relationship with God is about giving our hearts over to God so that he can plant inside of us his being and his character so that the way that we desire to live does not it is above any law. I'll go one further. You don't believe me? Go back with me to the text. Uh, if we look at verse 23, after it names all of these fruits, it says, against such thing, there is no law. Right. So when we're talking about living by the spirit, it is because the power of the Holy Spirit living and moving inside of us does so in such a way that there there's nothing about our conduct that would be offensive to the law. Remember, primary the primary law that we want to follow is the loving of our neighbors as ourselves. And when we live and we think and we act in the interest of the love that we have for our neighbors then there is no law that we can break. Does that make sense? <clears throat> the other, so we, so we have this question, one, am I, am I living by the law or am I living by the spirit? Am I consistently trying to figure out if I've checked out the boxes? Am I consistently trying to figure out if I did the right thing, the, 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 this thing right or said this right? Am I consistently trying to 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 measure myself? You know, did did I do I have? A, we were talking about this last night in men's study. Uh, do I have a perfect attendance record at church? Did I give every time? You know, did I did I did I uh, quote the right Bible verse? We begin to become very legalistic 
But what we see consistently through the history of the Hebrew people is that even though they were keeping the Sabbath, even though they were doing all these things, checking off all the law boxes, that what was happening in their heart was still cut off from God. And oftentimes, and that's why we still see today people who are really good church people, really good religious people, but not good Christians. And I know that's going to maybe somebody be like, oh, what do you mean? No, there's a bunch of folks moving in the world that by the standards of the church, little C, they are the they're the biggest Bible carrying, largest cross wearing scripture quoting. They sit on every auxiliary. They do. Uh, they, they show up at every service. They're a part of every leadership board. But when we look at the condition of how they treat people, when they look at the condition of, of, of how they interact with the world around them, it does not match up to who Jesus Christ was. Right. Even the way that we look at how we deal with issues today. Uh, <clears throat> we can look at issues uh, like abortion. We can look at issues about poverty. We can look at issues about our sisters and brothers in the LGBTQ community. And oftentimes in all of these, we see portions of our community that have taken a legalistic approach to it, but have not begun to deal with what happens when we live by the spirit. Because again, if we did, we would not be so con concerned with legislation about those issues. We would be trying to figure out, are we practicing love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness for our sisters and brothers who are dealing with these issues? Are we looking at the problems, challenges, and concerns of the people that we love, of the people in our communities, of our neighbors? Are we looking at it and, 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 and responding to it in a way that is consistent with how the Holy Spirit deals with us? And this is really the, 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 the primary question. Do we deal with people like God deals with us? And better, do we deal with people the way we wish and desire God to deal with us? What if, we, what if God dealt with us the way that we dealt with folks because they are different? What if God dealt with us based on the way that we dealt with brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ community? What if God dealt with us uh, the way that we deal with sisters and uh, with sisters that have the tough decision to make around abortion? What if we dealt? What if God dealt with us the way that we dealt with poor people? What if God dealt with us the way that we deal with people who who speak differently from us? What if God dealt with us the way we deal with people who are drunk? or homeless, or drug addicted? What if God approached us the same way we approach those people? Now, some of us worshiping tonight may say, you know, pastor, I, I'm, I'm compassionate, I'm loving, I'm understanding. Uh, I, I approach it with joy and peace. I, I'm, I have forbearance, I'm kind, I'm good. And that's praise the Lord. But, what if, but if that's not our answer tonight, uh, I wanna make that the, the benchmark against how we deal with folks who are different than us. I also wanna make it the benchmark in how we deal with ourselves. That rather than holding up some checklist of rules that we have to follow, rather than, 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 than becoming disciplinarians and, legally, and legalese, and speaking legalese, that we begin to ask God to transform our heart. Again, this question, am I living by the spirit or am I living by the law? Uh, scripture says that the law was made for man. Man was not made for the law. In other words, that uh, the law really is a reminder. Paul even goes far farther to say that it is a tutor that ushers us back into righteous and holy living. But it is only a tutor because when we give our lives over to the Holy Spirit, that which is necessary to live a life pleasing to God is planted inside of our hearts so that we no longer have to do this checklist uh, in order to be in order to feel like we are pleasing to God. Does that make sense? Hey, Sister Tracy, what's going on? Glad you could join us tonight. Good to see you. Good to glad to be here tonight. Oh, this yeah. is a deep. This is deep. 
Praise the <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah, we are we are in uh Galatians, the fifth chapter, uh, verses 13 through 26. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um and so when, when we talk about this letter, Paul is imploring that we do not go uh, back to living by the law. Now, I, I want to I highlight a difference, right? Um, go with me to verse 19. And I just want us to look at the first couple of words. Uh, in verse 19, it says, the acts of the flesh are obvious, right? If you jump down to verse 22, Paul then begins to talk about, but the fruit of the spirit is dot, dot, dot. Paul is suggesting and introducing the fruit of the spirit, what's happening inside of us as a remedy to the actions of the flesh, the things going on outside of us, right? Check this out. What if, what if we understood that everything that comes out of us, everything that, that, that emanates from us is about what's planted inside of us? See, Paul doesn't go and start to refute actions. Uh, he doesn't say in order to fight the acts of the flesh, that you go and read your Bible, that you go to church and worship service, that you pay your tithes. He does not refute actions with actions. What Paul says to us is, in order to fix the things that we desire externally from us, we must deal with what's happening inside of us. Does that make sense? That rather than try to match actions with actions, that we want to match spiritual transformation that fight our that fight off our fleshly desires that rather than trying to 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 you know oh i i i struggle and i desire liquor well now i'm my 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 the the solution is that i want you to fight to abstain from liquor no, I want you to fight to allow, I want you to open your heart to allow the Lord to move in, to deal with the reason that you have this desire for liquor. See, this is what we miss, that the, 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 the acts of the flesh are influenced by the condition of the heart. Last night, we talked about this, that, 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 that the acts of, of flesh come down to two things what we desire, and what we do. If you're taking notes, I want you to put that in your notes, that the acts of the flesh come down to two things, what we desire and what we do. What we desire, the things that we want, and what we do. How we put out what's in our heart into action. Paul does not tell us the answer to this is to change our actions. That will come. I don't, I don't want anybody, uh, hey, Auntie Faye, good to see you. I don't want anybody thinking I'm saying, no, you don't have to change your actions. We can stay just like we are. What I'm saying is that the way that we get to the change in our actions is not meeting action by eating, meeting flesh action by flesh action. We beat flesh action by transition and transformation of our heart through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So when we look at when we look at this text, uh, again, if if the acts of the flesh are determined by what we desire and what we do, our actions and our desires are only conditions of our heart. Again, if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this. Our desires and our actions, our desires and our actions are motivated by the condition of our heart. See, when we give it, when we're giving into a life that is driven by chasing after the desires of our flesh, Chances are, and you could match this up, I want to encourage each and every one of us, think about a time when we were living out of line with God's will for our life. 
think about a time where 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 you struggled to 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 really live a holy and righteous life. You got that time in your head? Just give me an amen or say amen if if you've got that time in your head. Yeah. Now I want I want to I want to ask ourselves in that time did we feel love? Did we have joy? Were we at peace? Were we forbearing? Were we kind? Or were we experiencing kindness? Were we experiencing goodness? Were we practicing faithfulness? Was gentleness and self-control in our space? And I would bet a million dollars the answer is no. Because the 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 the, the thing that we're, when we when we seek after and we strive after the things of the flesh, it's because we are trying to fulfill a void that is set forth in our spirit and in our heart. That when we hunger after when we hunger after these fleshly things, it's because we're trying we're we're trying to use the flesh to fulfill a void that's spiritual. You don't believe me? Ask anybody who's addicted to alcohol. Ask anybody who suffers from a drug addiction. Ask sisters and brothers who, who chase women and chase men. That 25 times out of 20, it's because there's something that is unmet in their spiritual place. And the enemy simply knows that if we continue to stay focused after trying to uh, heal this spiritual, meet this spiritual need through through fleshly means, that not only will we never meet reach our goal, but that eventually we will lose focus from who God has called us to be and who He created us to be. That we will deplete ourselves because all of the things of the flesh lead to death. And that ultimately we would never, we would be running in circles and never achieve that which God has promised us. Which is why I believe that Paul does not give us a prescription of action to, to fight the flesh, but a prescription of transformation. He doesn't say, in order to get away from these things again, go to more church services, read more Bibles, and, and understand what I'm saying very clearly. These are, these are tools that God provides for us to help us to sustain our relationship and sustain our spiritual selves and to fortify our hearts. But these are not the tools that he's given us for transformation. Because the transformation that has to happen in order to overcome our fleshly desires are not external tools about what we say and about what we do, but they are internal tools that speak and minister to the condition of our heart. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's cool. The other, the other piece that I want to highlight here. Uh, is that this is about relationship. Again, everything that we read in Paul in the epistles in general, every, the, 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 the thing that we're getting most importantly from the epistles is how to live together in the Christian community. I want to be clear that every time we read an epistle, that the epistle is teaching us and training us and how to live together in Christian community. This is why in thir this is why in verse 13 he says you my sisters and brothers were called to be free but do not use your freedom to indulge in flesh rather to do what serve one another humbly in love for the entire law is fulfilled by keeping this one commandment Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out because you will be destroyed by each other. 
In other words, we are all here together. We are all desiring to live in Christian community. And we talked about this a couple of Sundays ago, uh, that church uh, is not the concept that we understand it to be now, uh, particularly because folks live much farther. Uh, a, a significant portion of the church community are commuters. Uh, it's not about meeting in Sunday in a building, but that the church big C and what should also be little C is about us communing together as a family, us coming together and engaging together as a family and as a community. Uh, and that in context, when we're reading this, Paul is talking to the Galatians who live and work and serve in a physical community, living and laboring with one another. And when they begin to get back into this kind of fleshly competition of keeping the law, what he sees is that there begins to be infighting. There, there begins to, 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 to be uh, self, to, to, to be sabotage of one another, that there begins to be trying to one up and be better than one another. And this is what he said. And, the, and, and there, there is this goal to do what makes me feel best, right? What is going to make me feel good? What's going to make me happy rather than uh, engaging in what will feed and, 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 and nourish the greater community? Does that make sense? And so that, that, that fir the first part of this portion of the letter that we're reading tonight uh, is about how we engage together as a Christian community. I would encourage you uh, to go and, and read the first portion of this chapter uh, because it will give you even greater context as to what's happening in the Galatia at this time, that there are people who are coming and creating dissension and, and confusion amongst the believers there. Um, and Paul is really trying to take this opportunity to, re to correct and redirect the, the direction of the community, reminding us that not only do we have power and gifts through the Holy Spirit, but that the Holy Spirit has deposited a demeanor inside of us that when we allow the Holy Spirit to have its perfect work in us, uh, will show up in ways that lift us up and build the community around us. So back to this question. Do I live by the law or do I live by the flesh or do I live by the spirit? Uh, we, we, we asked this question uh, last night in the men's study. If you could be absolutely free, right? Paul says this earlier. He says, you were called to be free. but don't use your freedom to indulge in your flesh. Tonight, one of the questions we wanna wrestle with, if we were absolutely free, what kind of life would we live? If you weren't worried about going to hell, if you weren't worried about people talking bad about you, if none of that, and, and, and I pose this question in that way, uh, because there are some of uh, there are some people who uh, solely practice Christianity and solely go to church and solely gave their life to Christ because they were afraid to go to hell. Right? There's a significant portion of the Christian community uh, that their whole relationship with Jesus Christ is fear of hell. Well, once we give our life to Christ, hell is no longer an issue because we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. So now we have a responsibility to ourselves and to the community to say, now that I'm not worried about going to hell, how am I supposed to show up in the world? Now that I'm free of sin, now that I'm free of uh, condemnation, now that I'm free of the penalty of death, through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, now that I'm free from all of that, who am I going to be? 
And while that sounds like a, a, an easy question, uh, it is not one that I, one, I think that we answer honestly. Two, that we are intentional about live, about answering in our everyday life. And I, I say one when when I make those two points, I mean one, I don't know that there's a I don't know I, I don't know that most Christians understand that after we've given our life to Jesus Christ, hell and death is not the focus anymore. Remember, Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. He says, I did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. Right. In other words, to make the law more full and complete in us. Not that he was adding to the list because we were missing boxes to check, but because Jesus understood that the law needed to live in our hearts. And not on our walls or under our arms. But that it had to be chiseled on the stone of our hearts. So that once we weren't worried about death that we could get to the business of living. Again, we talked about this as we talked about the gifts of the spirit that we got so caught up on teaching people that uh, teaching people about repentance, we never talked to them about the power. And tonight here we are uh, with facing this same thing. We talk about repentance, but are we talking about the peace? That now that you can be at peace and, 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 and that we have salvation, freedom from death, freedom from, from condemnation, freedom from hell, now who is it that we will choose to be? Because we have the option. Hey, Brother John, good to see you. Uh, be, because now we have the option. This is why he says, uh, you have the freedom, but not to indulge in your flesh. In other words, you have a choice. We have a choice. We can use our freedom to indulge in our flesh, or we can use our freedom to serve one another in love. And our freedom comes with an understanding that if we focus on trying to please our flesh, that it will not allow us to love our neighbor. That we will devour each other and we will be destroyed by one another. But what happens if we were truly free? Last night, as we were talking, uh, I don't know if it's my favorite movie, but it's a movie that I've, that I've paid attention to just because it's such a peculiar idea. And sometimes in, in this country, I feel like we're really close to, uh, to it anyway. I don't know if you've ever watched The Purge. Uh, there's a, a number of uh, of uh, iterations of it. They got all types of different purges. Uh, but the concept of the purge is that for 24 hours, uh, you can go and do whatever you want. They've got the American purge, the first purge. Now I think they got a TV show purge. Uh, but for 24 hours throughout America, uh, you can do whatever you want. And of course, uh, inside of that premise, there are a number of people who have decided to go and just go do all types of crazy stuff, steal, murder, beat, maim, torture, uh, uh, wild orgy parties, just you name it. They've decided that for this 24 hour uh, uh, raping each other. And it goes again, it, it goes to what this scripture is saying. Right. In a world where people don't under, because we don't understand what real freedom is. When we when we only believe that freedom is freedom from punishment. We do all the things we were afraid not to we were afraid to do because we did not get punished. There is not a greater sign of enslavement. Than the only way that we can think of freedom is the ability to do things that we would have been punished before punished for before but freedom is not the ability 
to not be punished. Freedom is the ability to choose the life that we desire to live free from our trauma and our pain. Free from fear. That when we really talk about are we free, not just are we free from rules, not just are we free from punishment, but are we free? Are we free from defining how we live our lives based on the trauma that we've experienced? Does that make sense? Again, connected to this idea that the desires of our flesh are still trying to fill voids that have been left. I've been having this conversation a lot with, with some close friends about um, spaces where we attach ourselves to, to synthetic, uh, to synthetic uh, 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 manifestations of the things that we desire. Because we did, we could not find friendship. We adopted synthetic friendship. We connected ourselves to people who we know did not have our our best uh, our, our 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 best uh, circumstances in mind. When we needed relief, we turned to drugs or alcohol uh, as a synthetic means of escape from the things that we're struggling with and suffering from. Uh, that when we have uh, 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 struggles or disappointments, right, that we give ourselves over to, to, to synthetic means to make us feel better, to pacify us, right? The same thing that we talk about uh, with, 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 with medicine, that there's a number of medicines that we take that don't actually heal and cure the thing that's wrong with us. It simply numbs us and dulls us to the pain. And when it wears off, we're back, we're back confronted with the pain that we were suffering from. That's not freedom. That's not healing. Again, which is why Paul is saying the things that we need to change is not external things. I don't want to challenge your fleshly actions by, by, by religious actions. I want to challenge your fleshly actions by the transformation of our hearts. I want us to look at our hearts and say, my desire is to follow after my flesh. My flesh desires things that are impacted by what's going on in my heart. So in order to, 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 to discipline myself against what my flesh desires to do, I need to do, I need to deal with what's going on in my heart. Does that make sense? And, and it, I, I hope I'm not talking in circles about this thing. Uh, uh, Sister Tracy, talk to me. Am, 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 I, am I making some sense tonight? Yeah, that's clear. That, that's clear to me. Yeah. Amen. So, Sister Caldwell, uh, Auntie Faye, talk to me. Let me know. Brother John, let me know if, if this makes sense, that, that, that this idea of, of, of not trying to fight fire with fire, but fighting fire with spirit, not trying to fight flesh with flesh, but fighting flesh with transformation of our hearts is what Paul is, an is, is answering here. And that once we begin to allow the Holy Spirit to deposit its fruit in us, to deposit it, the, 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 the transformational power of its fruit inside of us, when we begin to, to exhibit the Christ character and the characteristic of the Holy Spirit, in our lives, what we will find is that's where freedom lies. One of the places where uh, where folks can can get tripped up about Jesus, right? Because we we don't always teach this correctly. Uh, Jesus has passage where he tells people, "Look, if if they come and ask for your coat, ask for your coat, ask for your your coat, give them your cloak too. If a soldier tells you to walk a mile." Walk two miles. If they come and slap you, offer them the other cheek. Uh, Jesus is not teaching us to be passive. This was not intended for Christians to be punks who let folks whoop us upside the head and take our stuff. What Jesus was saying is, be so, and, and some of these things were legal things 
that could happen. Uh, soldiers could come and, and, and ask you for your stuff. They could, you know, cause for you to have to walk a certain distance. What Jesus was saying is be so content in all things that there's nothing that can take your freedom away. And we see it repeated through history. Nelson Mandela, when he was in prison, I, he, 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 and, and people kind of talk about where this uh, quote actually came from, but uh, whether it was him directly or him quoting someone, what he says is uh, that if he had left prison angry at his jailers, that he would have still been in prison. What he's communicating is that he understood that being free was not so much about being outside of the bars of the jail, but not allowing the bars of the jail to be inside of him. Because even if he was released, if his anger, if his disappointment, if his hurt, if his rage from being in prison and the things that he experienced were still in his heart, he would still be in prison even though he was physically free. And there's so many of us that are still in prison by old hurts, by, by still chasing after and trying to solve old pains that we, we, we think we are free when we are still in prison by our circumstance. And what Paul is offering us is to say, yep, when you followed after your flesh, you gave into all of these things because you thought that it was what made you free. And again, let's remember uh, that we're, we're talking about societies that did uh, understand and exhibit freedom around uh, the liberation of sexual activity, right? What do you mean? Uh, in Hellenistic cultures, um, illicit sexual activity was something really that was held for the rich and the wealthy. That's why they had they had, you know, temples where that was a part of their ritual work where you go have sex with young boys. This all 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 of this stuff like this is not magical language Paul is using. Paul is speaking to the culture. He's like, "Oh, well, we don't have that today." Well, I would disagree because what did we just see uh with the Epstein trial? A whole island where rich and wealthy people are able to go and practice all types of, of, of unholy things, right? Victimizing people, taking advantage of young women. So we still see it. It's not foreign. We still see where society takes freedom, and that freedom is given because of our economic means. That freedom is given because our, of our social standing, uh, that the better you have in life. And so there are people who view this freedom as an excuse to engage in these acts of the flesh. That because we are free, that freedom gives us the leeway and the pathway to indulge in things that make our flesh feel good. And what Paul is saying is that's not real freedom. And that if, if that is what you would do with your free energy, with your free time, with your free resource, being free of consequences, you don't even understand freedom. Because that freedom will only lead to death and bondage. But when we walk in the freedom of the Holy Spirit, what we find is that the Holy Spirit deposits in us Love, peace, joy, forbearance or long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And when we have when we when we have that Christ character in us, when we have that Holy Spirit presence in us, there's not anything that can enslave us. There's not anything that can put us in bondage because that's not about what's happening externally. That is what the Lord has placed in our hearts. And what is in our hearts is what comes forth out of our lives. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sister Faye Swan uh, says, uh, 
uh, we can change and we are a better person and we are happy. Amen. That that when we when we give into the life in, into a life in the spirit, that transformation is possible. That change is possible. And then we can find happiness. We can find joy. And not only that, but we can be that in the presence of other people. Have you ever just met somebody that not that they're always happy, but when they're present, that you can feel, uh, uh, that you feel light, that you feel lifted, that you feel empowered, that you just feel better when these people are around? Are there people in your life like that? That you don't know, you can't always tell what it is. And even on a bad day, even when they might have something going on, that when they, when, when you see them, you just feel lighter. They might not do anything for you. They might not have said anything to you, but just their sheer presence makes you feel safe, makes you feel light, makes you feel empowered. This is what the fruits of the spirit do. The reason that God wants us to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, the reason that God wants us to promote this Christ character is because this is the type, this is what the world needs. The world needs believers who carry the spirit and presence of the, the power and presence of the Holy Spirit inside of them so much that it emanates from them. I'll, 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 I'll go even one more extreme just so you really get it. Have you ever met a person who drinks so much that the liquor smell just comes out of their pores? Or somebody who smokes so much weed that even if they weren't smoking, the weed just still emanates from them? What if believers in Jesus Christ walked around like that? What if we walked around that even though we it, it's Wednesday and we ain't been to church since Monday, that the Holy Spirit was just coming out of our pores? What, what, if, what if we spent so much time in the presence of God and worshiping and loving on God that, that the Holy Spirit just, it all, we, we just always smelled like God. We just always gave off the scent and the aroma of the Holy Spirit. What would the world be like if we didn't just have to be just coming from church in order to be shining brightly with the power of the Holy Spirit? What would our communities, what would our families be like if we were as committed to, to, to emanating the, the residue of God and the residue of Holy Spirit as those who are struggling in their addiction to, to drugs and to alcohol? What, what if we just stunk with the power of the Holy Spirit? What if we allowed God to deposit so much of himself into us that, 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 that it, it, it was just coming out of our pores, that if we talked to you too much, that you could smell the Holy Spirit on our breath, that if you looked in our eyes, you could see evidence of us spending time with the Lord. All the stuff that we see folks who, who are, are, are stuck in addiction, what if, what if we exhibited those characteristics because of our time with God? And I use that imagery because that's what we can relate to more because we don't see a bunch of people just overwhelmed with the power of the Holy Spirit. But we know folks overwhelmed with, you know, liquor spirits. Uh, but I, I believe that that's what God desires for us. Because what if we're in a place where we can't take actions? What if we're somewhere where we don't have the ability to exercise our spiritual gifts? What if we've got to be somewhere where our ministry has to be a ministry of presence? If we don't get to prophesy, if nobody gets to hear how well we speak in tongues, if we don't get to quote a Bible verse. I, I, I think about this a lot with this new conversation, this reemerged conversation about uh, prayer being able to be brought into schools. And it, it made me question uh, how effective is the church if the only way that uh, we can bring prayer into schools is if we can do it publicly and it's sanctioned by the school. What would happen in a school if the if teachers who profess Jesus Christ, if their Christ character and their spirit were so powerful that they don't have to have no pu public prayer? You know how many places in the world there are that it is illegal to say Jesus 
that it is illegal to have church and yet somehow the church still grows? What's going on inside of those people? That even in a place where it's illegal, that the gospel is still thriving. And what's going on with us, that little tiny things like a football coach not being able to pray on a football field becomes such a big deal. I would suggest that if the only way that these children, if the only way that these schools, if the only way that these public spaces know the power of Jesus Christ is because we got to pray publicly, we have a deficit of spiritual fruit deposited inside of us. And I don't say that uh, I don't say that in an ignorant way that doesn't understand uh, the, the ease of being able to do things publicly. I don't say that from a position of agreement that prayer should be banned. I think it would be wonderful if we could openly pray in our schools. I think it's wonderful uh, when we are able to live our lives based on the principles that the word teaches us and to share that with other people. But I think if that's the only way that we are able to bring the spirit and the presence of God to people, we are not that powerful in the first place. And we are going to have to seek God's face to ask him to deposit more of his fruit inside of us. So that even when we have to be silent, that his word goes forward. That even if we can't shout Jesus and tell people, God bless you, that the fruit that is deposited in us is so evident. Because you can't, you can't mistake the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of nice people who don't know Jesus, and it's different. I know really, really, really nice, kind people. And I know the difference between a person who's really nice and a person who has the fruits of the spirit deposited in them. And I'm sure you do too. So we don't have to get caught up in none of these debates. We don't have to, excuse me. We don't have to get unwound. When the government says because of COVID, we're going to shut churches down. We're Oh, well, how are people going to know Jesus? If people only know Jesus because we're in this building two hours a day, we weren't telling them about Jesus in the first place. But when we take on the fruit of the spirit for real, we will become what the world needs. And what the world absolutely needs right now is for those of us who the Holy Spirit has planted fruit in to be out in the world planting those seeds in others. The world is full of people chasing after their fleshly desires, believing that somehow they will find freedom and relief from that, in that. And it becomes important for us to deposit that which God has deposited in us, to introduce to people that which God has deposited in us in the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are not things that we can do for people. These are the things that must be shown in how we live and how we interact with our sisters and brothers. Amen. Whew. So I want to say thank everyone again for an amazing Bible study. Uh, we're excited. I don't, I, I, uh, I am still working towards what uh, the, the next path in this journey that we're on this year will be. 
But I pray that um, as, as this is kind of our last uh, lesson uh, dealing with uh, the fruits and the gifts of the Spirit and this, this, this work on the Holy Spirit, uh, my prayer is that it has been as beneficial for you as it has been a blessing for me and that you will take some time, go back and check out the, the lessons of the last two months and allow God to speak to you, to grow his gifts and uh, and his fruits in you and that you will see it be a blessing to you, to your family and to your community. Lord God, we thank you for this time. We bless your holy name. We make ourselves available to you, not just in the gifts that we use, but in the fruits that we bear. Be glorified in our life and in our work. Be glorified both in our character and in our cooperation with your word. We thank you. We love you. And we bless you because you're good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. I love you all. Have a blessed and wonderful week.